Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Applying Ethology webinar. I am Laura Whalen, a postdoctoral researcher at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. As we begin today, I want to remind you all to please turn off your camera and microphone. Should you have questions for our speaker, please type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. It is a pleasure to introduce Sarah Hinsa, an assistant professor at the University uh, at uh, the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna, also known as BOKU. Sarah studied veterinary medicine in Germany before completing her MSc in Applied Animal Behavior and Welfare in Edinburgh, UK. She then completed her PhD on effective states in horses in Switzerland. Sarah now focuses on identifying and validating behavioral and cognitive indicators of effective states in farmed animals especially pigs and cattle. Today, Sarah is going to discuss the opportunities and challenges associated with behavioral tests and animal welfare research. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much, Laura, for this nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, Jen asked me actually already half a year ago um, whether I would like to say something about potentials and challenges of behavior tests and animal welfare research, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity today to do so. So this is a new talk. I haven't talked about this, this question before really. And this is why when I started preparing this talk, I realized I should have raised the title differently. And oh, okay, it's going, it's working. Um, it's not only about asking the right questions, but it's also about asking the right questions in the right way, which is um, very important. And the title also says behavior test and animal welfare research, which is quite a broad topic. And I cannot give an overview of all the tests in animal welfare research. And I cannot even give a whole overview of um, what I wanted to focus on today, which is behavior tests to assess effective states across species. So I want to start with just a very, very brief overview and then more share um, experience with you. So probably the best known um, tests um, used to assess effective states or more specifically the effective valence of effective states are the cognitive bias tests, where we know that um, our mood or the mood of a non-human animal affects how we judge situations, what we pay attention to, and also what we recall when thinking back like our memory. However, this is in brackets here because memory bias tests have been tried to be to do have people have tried to develop these tasks, but it has been very difficult and challenging, and that's not yet a real working task so far. Um, in our own group, our PhD student Christina Kuhl, she developed a time perception task, also asking the question like that mood also affects um, whether time drags or flies by. We all know that when we're, for example, bored or having fun and very well known also place preference or avoidance tests. And these all um, require training as everyone who has tried them, they acquire often a very lot training. Attention bias perhaps less, but most of them require training. Um, and then there are tests that do not require training. And there's also a whole bunch of them, but for example, yet here a battery of tests um, focusing on the setting fearfulness, um, of those running um, lab animals like rats and mice is the open field, the novel object or the elevated plus maze test. Um, we have also a test um, assessing fearfulness or more broad, the animal human, human relationship with the human approach or avoidance test. And um, very commonly done also in biomedical research um, to assess depression-like states, the forced swim test. However, as I said, I, it's not a going to be a lecture. I was asked to share experiences. So um, if you want to know more about it, I just had another look into it. We have that here as well. It is asking an email book by um, Dieter Nielsen, um, where you can get more information if you're interested in specific tests. I would like um, to share now some experience I made um, together with different colleagues. And I would, for this, like to focus on the judgment bias task. I guess 
Most of you know the principle um, of the task. It can be illustrated very nicely by whether um, you are going to um, judge this glass as being half full, where we would say you are more on the optimistic side of things, um, or whether you judge it more as half empty, or whether then you're more on the pessimistic side. And we will get back um, to how, how this is done in, for non-human animals in a second. And then we, I will discuss with you tasks I have done before, or we are doing also currently. And this is a slide I found um, that I made during my PhD. It was for a talk, um, like walks and talks, so not such a conference talk or anything else. Um, and it is about, um, basically, it's another slide for saying it's my journey through the kingdom of judgment bias with, um, you probably all recognize him, Mike Mendel and his group who came up with translating this task in non-human animals. So how it all started, um, and this is basically what I haven't shown anymore since my PhD defense, because it's a task I, I wouldn't do again, I wouldn't uh, run again, and I wouldn't recommend to run. But in order to share the experiences, I wanted to show, yeah, how things can go, can go wrong and how to learn from them. And this is actually my, my first PhD experiment. I ran um, trying to, yeah, my, the plan was to, to develop a judgment bias task for horses, to validate it and then to apply it, to um, answer different research questions. And um, yeah, I got stuck basically with the first question, um, trying to develop a nicely working task for horses. Um, this was an auditory task. Um, earlier this today, I still had slides trying to say why auditory and not, for example, starting with the spatial tasks. Um, however, I now threw them out for time reasons. Um, so we start with an auditory task. We had some thoughts on why an auditory task, and it was actually also the first task run with rats in Bristol, which was an auditory task. And what you can see here is the basic um, principle of the task. We have here the horse in the start box, here on the other side of the arena, the bucket. Here the horse is trained. If there's, for example, a low frequency tone, there will be a reward in the bucket. And if there's a high frequency tone, there will be no reward in the bucket. But if you still go there, you will even have a timeout effect. So you will be punished basically by a timeout. This is the principle. And then, of course, we all know the system of the judgment bias. At some point, you get the um, ambiguous cue, the, like the tone in the middle. And the question is, is the horse going or not going? So um, I was optimistic, and I was not on my own. And I'm very happy to see that, Imar, you are also here today, perhaps even Luca. So I wasn't doing this on my own. I mean, I ran the horse experiment on my own. but. Um, I got a lot of support and we had a lot of discussions by Ima Murphy and Luca Milotti. Um, Ima ran the, um, the judgment by his task before um, because she had already finished her PhD or was about to finish the sixth. And then Luca uh, did also an auditory task with Brad. So when I talk about we, I, I mostly mean for, them, for the start of the talk, the three of us. So we were quite optimistic. We, we, yeah, we wanted to make it work. We worked hard. Uh, we aimed high and sometimes even higher. And then this is what happened. It took forever um, with all species. And um, it took a lot of time to train the animals for this task to make sure they, they had learned um, the association between children and what they had to do. And besides the time, it was also that all three of us felt that there was we were a bit frustrated because we felt animals knew um, when what the task was about, but they didn't um, respond accordingly. So give, let me give an example. In a negative a trial in the auditory task for the horses, for example, they would know, I had the feeling, just the feeling, they know that there was, um, it was a negative trial, but um, they would still go because, I mean, we were singing how stallions, they were never outside, we didn't work with um, strong punishers. Of course, we also 
adapted all these things. We I changed punishers. I used a stronger punisher, so we, that it's not like we um, we didn't try to adapt many many things, but still we felt like the lack of control the horses had in negative or the animals had in negative trials fell uh, led to frustrated animals, but also frustrated experimenters. So. At some point, we sat together, um, all three of us in Bern, and um, tried to pool our experiences and tried to tackle the challenges we had been facing and thought about um, different solutions, how to come up um, with a task design that is less frustrating for all of us. And this is what I would like to share with you now. Um, and before I share the task design per se, I would like to show you um, some things that you should know so that you understand what I'm showing you in a, in a second. This is the gold box um, from the horse task that I run. Um, you see here the lid, it's yellow and blue. No worries, it's not about the color discrimination task, it's a spatial task. I will come to it in a second. It's just to get the attention from the horse, so it's, it's always the same, doesn't really matter. Um, we had a um, draw um, below, like we had. Um, um, Sect two levels so that we could control for um, odor uh, from the rewards. And the, this little hole here in the end, in the back, is for me to put my hand to, <laughs> to give a reward basically. And you see here on the right side a horse eating the reward um, from a reward box. This was how it all worked. It was now a spatial task. So now location is the cue, not tone anymore. We don't have tones, we have now location. Signaling either reward in this case, go is the left box is open, there will be a reward. If the right box is open, there will be no reward. And now comes the tricky or the new, very new part is that we used a trial initiator. What does it mean? The, each horse had to had learned before we trained um, the positive and negative consequences that they had to initiate each trial. So they had to push this bottle in order to make one of these gold boxes being open. So um, this means um, touch the bottle and either the, the positive or the negative gold box opens. And I will show you a video so that you have an idea of what this looks in reality. Nah. Oh, this worked a second ago still. Uh, which is a shame because I will have so many more videos. Is it okay if I quickly stop sharing and try it again because it worked five minutes ago still before we started? That's quite okay, Sarah. Thank you. I'm not sure what happened here. Um. Sorry, just one second. I think it's probably because things are open. So. Um, this is always a stressful situation. I don't know. Okay, let's see. Oh. Okay, that is really just one more because one more time because there's as I said, several videos, and I will try it without sharing what's wrong. Okay. So if it doesn't work now, it doesn't work. But let's see one more. Okay. Whew. Okay, this works now. This is Newton. Newton has learned the task and uh, he knows how to initiate each trial. And this is his positive goal box. This is his negative box. And he has learned to go here once the positive box has opened and not to go here uh, when the negative box is open. It's, of course, not always positive, negative in a row. Of course, you would learn then with that, but it can be up to three times positive or three times negative. And we see now two negative in a row 
he doesn't even need to turn anymore. He hears already it's the wrong side open here. He almost makes a mistake, but on the way there, he remembers that this was wrong. So what does it mean here? Um, Newton has now control over the situation. He can initiate a trial, and once it's a negative trial, he can say, hey, I know that it is a negative trial. We don't need to wait for anything. I just touched the bottle again, what we call a reinitiation. I just touch it again. Please open another box or open the same, but just continue in the sequence. And once he has learned that, um, we can then open, of course, one of the boxes in the middle. Of course, not all at the same time as it is shown here, but um, one at a time. And if Newton then um, walks towards the box, we interpret this as an optimistic choice because he expects something positive in there. He expects a reward. If he initiates again, um, touches the bottle again, this is then interpreted as a pessimistic choice um, because he's not expecting a reward, but just says, hey, let's continue, let's go on. So um, we did not only do this with horses, or I ran with the horses, and then we had also the same experimental setup. Trying out, we tried it out with rats and two strings of mice to make sure not only horse specific, but um, to try it out across really different species, different in size, um, different in um, lighting conditions, for example, uh, rats and mice were tested in red light and, of course, very different ecological background. And we, um, this is the, the number of training sessions we needed for the Bonobo training then, once they are the animals shaped. And if we compare this to the first experiments we ran, we have here the comparison for um, horses and rats. We see the massive reduction in the number of sessions it took us. So for the horses, it um, dropped from 38, but there was a lot of variation, was up to 52, um, to around 11 in average. And for the set, for the rats, even from 42 to four sessions. And you see also how quick the mice are. And mice are also often very problematic because they are very impulsive and they also learn the task very nicely and very quickly. This was probably partly because um, also of the reduced session lengths we had, like we had 53 trials, like 25 positive, 25 negative, and 300 years per session, like in a test session, obviously. And um, for example, horses, they took 18 minutes and the rodent were really quicker to do that. And if we compare that with the previous experiments and horses and rats, um, we only had 13 trials before, which is also problematic from um, from the test results point of view, but I won't go into this too much today. Um, and um, it, it took us much more to have much less, a fewer trials. So who's good in math can really quickly see um, why it took on average, of course, a lot of variation, um, 20 seconds per trial for the horses. In the new design, it took almost two and a half minutes in the old design, and you can already calculate what this makes, what difference this all makes. So taken together from this first experience, I think um, the advantages of the, using the trial initiator is that we give the animals control. That's the major, major advance, um, advantage. Um, and of course, this reduces frustration in the animals because they have this control and they, they can decide, let's continue, let's go on, I don't want to wait. Um, it's all combined, of course, all these points about the session length was um, very much reduced or the number of trials you could do in the same time. And it's it's still a go-no-go um, task we are doing, but it is it, it still requires also an active response. So it's not only a no-go because perhaps an animal is distracted or an animal doesn't want to go anymore because um, the animal needs to actively initiate a new trial, we, we have an active response, which is quite an advantage of this task as well. And then what we also realized is that, of course, animals are often distracted, something is going on on the farm. Um, here we have the pigs as well, I will show you in a second, but also with the horses, for example. And then you simply don't give a cue. You wait until the animal initiates and say, okay, if you're distracted now, take a break. And once you are paying attention, then you, the, the animal will um, initiate and you can have the cue um, in the right moment. And of course, what is also a big um, makes a big difference, especially when working with larger animals, 
is that um, you you don't need to like for example I have before I had to lead the horse back so I walked in I, I, I took the horse you lead it back or you, with the pig you know you can push it away back to the start box and this is not needed anymore which of course is good from an experimental design point of view because then you are not queuing involuntarily or you are not um, you know you're not taking your mood and uh, like with a bad mood for example the horse and, and having perhaps kind of emotional contagion um but the animal is doing it on its own basically and you don't need a second person you saw in the video that i could still see the horse and um, we have changed this with the pigs now so for the pigs the experimenters are behind uh, a wall that is high enough so you are not seen by the pigs we have like a a mirror using we use a mirror room so that we can see the pig, but the pig does not see the, the person behind um, this wall. So taking together this first step, uh, we thought that this this kind of um, using a spatial task design um, combined with the trial initiator is promising in that it is feasible, valid, and works across species. And we even um, yeah had has now a broader range of species. So. This is still videos that I hope will work uh, for the rodents. I would like to show with you, uh, show you in a second the mice here and the rats here. Um, but we have also run this um, with a cat, and I think I saw Katka also being in the audience. Katka Pushkova, um, this was part of her PhD thesis. Um, here the calf initiating, and this is our work from um, Jesse Abtriance. Uh, who did this work with mammoth heads. Don't be confused, it's two pictures here. This mammoth head is just touching the trial initiator. It's this white thing here. And this is um, a picture from behind the view of the experimenters where you have then these goal holes that are going to be open. And I will start with the rats. Why will I do that? Um, yeah, let me find it. Ah, that's working, that's good. What you can see here is um, the trial initiator is here. It's not a bottle because it's working small rats. So the trial initiator here is um, um, a nose ho uh, hole where the, the rat um, nose pokes as an in initiation. And then one of these uh, little boxes, now it's the one of these little boxes opens and here's the positive one for the rat. So it goes and hits the negative, so it doesn't go. And why I start with the rats is that, and this is now the ambiguous here, the rat decided to go. Why I start with the rats is that you see in the rats and the horses, we still used um, these gold um, boxes, basically. And we ran this experiment first with the horses and the rats. For the mice, we did already an improvement, which we are now also doing with all the other species. Uh, you can see that here. Um, it's just turned the other way around, but here's the initiator again on the left side, and here's an opening of the positive trial for this mouse, and here's a negative, and it's very quick, and I cannot talk so quickly. But what you can see here, we are not using gold boxes anymore, we are using holes. This has several advantages. It's much clearer when an animal shows a goal response. Like here, the red could, for example, have the head while turning over the box. Um, that was especially the case with the horses. And with the gold hole, you can really say, put your hand, put your head into the hole. And once the nose is through, basically that is a goal response. And we also started to only reward once the um, response has been made so that there's no unintentional queuing. Um, I'm not sure it has happened already, but with the mouse, she shows also at some point um, some displacement behavior. So that's also something uh, we liked to do that, or we made sure everyone had um, access to water because sometimes um, they just want to go and drink. They also get um, dry rewards, so it makes sense um, to have, give them the chance to drink, especially with the rodents. That was very helpful. Um, yeah, that is now our um, a picture of our design with the pigs. We use it for the time perception task, but also for the judgment bias. You see it here. Um, this arena with these holes as well. We use always holes now. You see the um, the reward pots um, behind. You see here pig eating from it. And this is from the experimenter. We, we have these sliding doors um, that we can um, pull open. And um, this is now, and it will be also a video in a second. Um, it's the same principle, but here's again one more 
um, change we made in the trial initiator. Perhaps you have seen it already. So this is like stepwise trying to refine the task. We are now using a bell. So why are we using a bell and not a bottle anymore? Um, it's because it gives feedback. It gives feedback all, um, to the pick when the pick has um, done a, a correct initiation. And it also gives feedback to the experimenter that the initiation was right. Because once you're doing it, you always think the animal would perfectly initiate and you know, touch the bottle. And then oh, it's sometimes very hard to say when it is a proper initiation. With the rats and the mice, it was very nice because it was automatically, you know, they needed to break a beam. So we got the feedback. And now with the pigs, we get it by having the, the bell ring. And um, you will now see um, the thingy. Um, the experiment you will also know I didn't share that you will not hear the, the bell of the uh, sound of the bell, but I just heard it. So it, uh, here's the bell making a sound. This is the positive trial for the pig. And um, it's the same principle as you have seen now several times. Once the negative door is open, the pig says, No, thank you. I know there won't be anything. Um, I will um, wait until another door will be open. This is now the ambiguous. This pack has decided not to go to this um, open middle door. So why I call this ongoing challenges is that because the pigs really create some challenges for us that we haven't experienced with the other species. So this is work by um, the MSC, MSC thesis by Kathleen Craig in collaboration with John Rural from the Vetmed University. And you don't need to understand this graph per se, um, and also not the treatments we have, but just the pattern of the graph shows you that our um, pigs responded too optimistically. Of course, in inverted commas, um, this doesn't mean they were too optimistic per se, but we have a real ceiling effect. So obviously, you don't find any treatment differences anymore if everyone is going every time. Not every time, of course, we have quite a range. And here for the near negative trial, so this is perhaps I should quickly say this, sorry, this is for the different um, trial types. These are the negative um, trials, so animals are not going. We have here on the y axis the um, proportion of, or the percentage of go responses. Animals are not going in the negative trial, they are going in the positive trial. And they are really, really often also going in the biggest case, uh, trials. This is what we didn't find for the other species. We always had a very nicely monotonically created response for the marmosets, the calves, the rats, the mice and the horses, but the pigs were here a bit different. This is one of the challenges we are facing. And the other challenge um, is we have um, here, it wasn't such a feeling effect. This is the work by um, Helen Sofist. It was also her PhD thesis. Um, I'm not showing you the same graph, so, so be careful, it's, it's a different one. It's now what we see here, the proportion of goal responses across sessions, across test sessions, so across days, basically. So we have here six test sessions, and you see the responses per ambiguous cue. So here's the near negative, here's the middle, and here's the near positive across the six sessions. What we see here also, middle and near positive, quite optimistic pigs, quite optimistic. Um, but what we also see here was in the negative that pigs tend to go more often ac um, across sessions. What does it mean? So for, for this to interpret, you need to know that we always reward when an animal goes in an ambiguous um, trial because we want that um, the, the consequence matches with the pig's expectation. And that's why we are rewarding in ambiguous trials. However, in contrast, again, we did check for this across all species. None of the other species ever learned and the ambiguous cues were uh, rewarded. So what we had like flat curves here, like, you know, it was always the same across sessions, but our pigs seem to learn that quite well. And we are not yet sure how to deal with it. So we, of course, reduce the number of test sessions, but of course, then you have also um, fewer trials. Um, that you can use for your analysis. So that are still ongoing challenges we are facing at the moment. 
Now I would quickly quickly check the time. Okay, quite um, late, but I still would quickly say um, um, introduce you to another challenge that is really also important to me, and that is um, how to test animals in which circumstances. Like we are usually working all with um, social animals because all, most of the animals we do animal welfare researchers are social animals, and we usually. You train and test them in social isolation. And we have now come up with what we call a social window, and you see this here uh, on the picture. And this is the opportunity for uh, um, the animal that is trained um, to have visual contact, auditory contact, but also some kind of physical contact with buddies. We call them buddies on the other side, so that you can imagine this a bit better. This is our apparatus. He is a trial initiator. Why this is a bottle is a different story now. But what you can see here, instead of the bell, um, where you can what you can see here is part of this social window. Um, so the trained animal can do its task without being disturbed or distracted. But once it decides, oh, I want to check now, and they do check, especially in the beginning, it can go here and see, are you still there? Everything okay? And we have done this now for several experiments and we have really had the gut feeling that uh, pigs are so much more relaxed and they can you have so much less habituation on time and um, you also you know I mean they are social animals so social isolation is obviously not uh, really natural for them and um, the also their personality different or individual differences, let's say like that, how how easy you can adapt to social isolation. And we, we really felt happy with this approach of having the social window. For the last experiment, they were not tested with the social window. So we had a phase when there were no social bodies anymore, but for most pigs, that's okay, as long as they have been habituated and trained with the social window. However, this is our gut feeling, and that's why we have one systematic study on it. Martina Kroll will do her master's thesis on that, where we test how um, social companions in the other room, this is our social window basically, this is our trained or tested pig, how these social bodies will affect habituation time, training time, and also the behavior of the animals um, during habituation and training. Last but not least, I wanted to um, share one more challenge with you, and that's only one slide. To finish up, and um, this is the one slide um, I took from our bigger boredom project of chronic boredom and pigs. Why did I take this? Because if you then have a look at what we are doing with these animals, um, we are training them um, quite a lot <laughs> actually until they can be tested. And this is somehow quite um, problematic when you are interested in a treatment effect, for example, of barren environments, of, of boredom, of something where training is actually quite enriching, cognitively enriching, and you are thinking, oh, are they really as bored as they should be? And um, for the, the, I was very afraid of that when we started our bigger project, and this is why we also had animals that were not trained and tested at all. So for, for example, behavioral observations that were never trained and tested and didn't have this human-animal relationship. Um, but on the other side, and this is why I want to share this with you, because it worked very nicely and we had no idea whether it would work like that. What you see here is across time, we had a block of training, which was most of the time, or even though it takes only a little um, space here, but um, we trained um, animals for quite a long time. And we tested them then as it is usually done. And then we had a time where they were just in their environment. So here it's just illustration of um, different environments, like for example, they're enriched. And they were not trained or any handled or anything um, for three weeks. They like had a break. Um, then we tested them again and we were like, okay, do they remember? Do they participate? And it works very, very well for many pigs because we had two different tasks, doesn't matter. But um, it was even five weeks. And also this was no problem at all. Then we switched treatments for half of the animals. And we had again this week um, a break of three weeks and um, or sometimes longer, a minimum of three weeks, and then tested them 
um, again. So we had them from very little piglets, like um, we took them after weaning until slaughtering, and we even tested these really, really big pigs, like with more than 100 kilos, and it worked very nicely. And they do remember very, very well. So this is also something I guess it will then work with every species and we need to try out. But I just wanted to share it because we always need to make sure our um, training is actually not interacting too much or as little as possible um, with the treatment we have. And with this, I would like um, to thank you for your attention. And I'm very curious about all questions that might pop up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your beautiful and clear presentation, Sarah. And yes, welcome everybody to type in questions if you have any, and hopefully you do. Uh, to start off, I have a few. The trial initiator, the bottle that you used, and then the bell, it seems to have numerous benefits. You mentioned decreased frustration, decreased time per session, and decreases uh, in mistakes, just to name a few. And to me, this is giving the experimental animals agency. And do you think there is something to the bottle slash cue slash trial initiator that we could learn from as we try to create environments that allow animals more agency? Yeah, it is, it is um, definitely giving the control is, is definitely something about agency. I, I was first thinking about saying this and I was like, no, let's stick to the control, but yeah, I completely see your point about the agency. Um, I'm not sure we can learn something from it for how to structure environments and bring more agency in it, but I think bringing more control or agency into test designs, yes, we can learn from that. I mean, I'm definitely in favor also of having it more in the, in the environments, of course, in the home pens, um, but yes, for Definitely for the experimental setup, I think we should think about how to how to increase it. I mean, it's also you know we are, we are always having an effect of we try to assess effective states and then we are messing up on having them socially isolated or we are messing up because they are frustrated within the task. I mean, we might mess up because ours seem to be super excited to get into the task. So it's not that the positive side also messes up obviously with the results or can mess up. But um, yeah, we, we across these species now, um, we really felt happy with the agency or control part of it. Yeah, thanks for that. So our first question says, thanks for the insightful talk, Sarah. So I assume the pigs cannot see whether a hole has food in it from their starting position. However, could it be possible that they smell the reward? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. Um, no, because we only reward them once they have made a decision. So they first have to stick their head um, through the hole and then they get the reward. So there is no potential queuing, also not, you know, by moving and making, yes, making noise while you put something into the truck or so. It is only once the animal has made um the decision um and they learn i mean sometimes you know it takes a second or so until they get the reward of course you try to act as quickly as possible but they learn it they they know they will wait for the second um they will even protest if it hasn't been enough or so so um they will not go without it <laughs> no i imagine they would not no <laughs> A few have asked if you could share the links or a list of the papers and books named in the presentation. Yes, sure. Perfect. Uh, another question. I recall a student study with a raven that had the problem of boredom as well. In fact, the raven became mischievous and selected wrong answers, the researchers suspected anyway. They went back and reviewed the footage and found specific behaviors associated with quote unquote mischievous answers versus others. So it, could there be something to watching closely the behavior when animals seem to become bored? Ooh, okay. <laughs> so I, I would love to give the boredom talk as well, <laughs> but that's not the topic of, of today. So two points that come into my mind. So yeah, like, very in a nutshell, very shortly in a nutshell, we, we try to um, 
assess boredom from very different components like behavior and cognition. We have the time perception task, judgment bias, attention bias, but also very closely um, the, the behavior. Um, this is one thing. Yes, definitely we try to, I mean, there is nothing about boredom yet. So we really need to explore it for the first time. Basically, I mean, there's a little bit or not a little bit. There has been the first things by um, first research projects by Becky Maher, Becky Maher and Charlie Byrne and Carol Wex, but otherwise there's really nothing on boredom and nothing for sure on boredom and pigs. Um, the other thing is what we are doing at the moment, and I think that's very important as well, is to look at the behavior of the animals while performing the task. So we are now, usually what you do and what you publish is you, you, you for example, count the goes and the no goes and have the proportion and so on, as I showed the results before some of the graphs. Um, but we are trying now to figure out a bit more in detail what's actually ha happening during this during this experiment um, while the animals are performing and trying to shed some more light on that as well. Yeah, looking at the whole study, always more videos to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Allison says, thank you for the very interesting talk. How do you think these test designs would translate to non-mammalian animals such as chickens? Would you expect similar or different outcomes slash challenges? Oh, that's a very good point because I forgot to put the chickens in, huh. in the slide because we have done this with chickens as well, actually, with layers. And um, so it worked very similarly. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm very sorry now for the chickens. <laughs> Uh, that I forgot them. Um, we had the same task design, the reward were obviously mealworms. Um, we had um, habituation for quite long, also with this social isolation, basically. Um, but otherwise, the, tri the, the design was absolutely um, the same as with the other species. With broilers, of course, I mean, what you need to consider is if you have a species that cannot walk so properly, um, this is something we are, have been thinking of also for a while to, to design a task. It's not only broilers, it's uh, also cattle sometimes, or like animals that don't run back and forth for 50 trials, basically. Um, there's something you need, I guess, something more stationary and not to run back forth, back forth. Sasha says, wonderful talk, thank you. Could you talk a bit about what the training sessions looked like? Okay, um, yeah, so we always start with um, the habituation, obviously, and combined with the habituation, we usually start with the shaping. The shaping is the, I would say, um, most interesting task um, because they, you can do most, um, basically, because um, there you need to, you need, but what you need to do is, I actually have a green bottle here, just, just by chance. Um, what, you, what you do is um, you have the bottle with you, for example, now with horses, and, and the, the horse touches the bottle, you give the reward. What touches, reward touches, reward, then you start moving this bottle away so that the horse really learns it's about the bottle, it's not about her hand or something like that, where the food comes from. And then at some point you put um, the bottle where it will at the end and you you as an experimenter quit, uh, uh, slowly move away so it's still about touching the bottle and getting moving away until the animal gets it and goes on from its own um from the bottle to to the gold boxes basically that's the the most interesting step i would think um then we have a stage where they are rewarded on both sides. That is something that is usually not done in judgment bias because, of course, you have then extinction learning afterwards before you do the go no go. Why we did that is that we wanted to tell the animals pay attention to the open door and not pay attention whether the positive door is open or not. So, this makes a difference. It doesn't make a difference in training but it makes a difference in testing. Because if you have learned, pay attention which door is open, you also pay attention to the ambiguous cues. If you have only learned, I only go if the positive door is open, 
I will only go when the part of the door is open, not when the ambiguous one is open. That's why we have this um, special kind of <laughs> um, step in between. And then we have what is most of the time is um, the training for the go no go responses. Um, but they, they across species, they learn this go no go quite soon and they they need to get to know by themselves that they can initiate. This is nothing you tell them. At some point they figure out, okay, I have been going to the negative and I don't never get anything. So and then they get it by themselves. Uh, perhaps I touch the bottle again and then she will continue with the sessions. Um, yeah, I think that's the overview of the training. Thanks for that, Sarah. Wendy asks, can you explain again what indicated a pessimistic attitude? What was this, what the beginning of the sentence? Can you explain again what was indicative of a pessimistic attitude? Okay, I guess it's, this, um, it's about, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's by definition, pessimistic and that's why it was an inverted comma and also Mike Mendel is very careful about this term because it, you can have a lot of discussion just about the term also already in human psychology um, what is meant here that you are not expecting something positive or you're expecting something negative so optimistic as expecting something positive meaning I go there because I think there will be a reward pessimistic I will not go there because I don't think there will be a reward that's why I say, hey, let's continue. I touch the bottle again. Let's let's uh, continue playing the game. Might be that there is a, again the negative box open, but it might be also a good chance, 50-50, that there is the positive box opening. And that's what we call then pessimistic in, 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 in the context of this task. Great. Katarina says, uh, thanks, it was very interesting. I'm thinking if we actually should always reward animals if they approach ambiguous cues. What do you think about rewarding them randomly? Same for all tested animals, of course. Yeah, that's a, um, it's always a lot of discussion. Uh, we are at the moment trying to automate the task and or in Wacheningen it is tried uh, together with um, Mike's team in Bristol. And this, uh, every time for all tasks, a uh, discussion that comes up because it's mostly that people don't reward in the ambiguous cues. We also started with that, but the horses after two times told me, I'm not going to continue if you are not giving me what I'm expecting. And it is also somehow logical because it is a mismatch. You know, if I'm going there, I'm expecting something. If I get something, I'm not even questioning it anymore because I expected something. But if I'm not going there, uh, and uh, no, sorry, if I go there and I won't get anything, then it's a mismatch with what I was expecting. And um, that's why we are rewarding. Um, however, we also see now this problem with the pigs learning it. Uh, and I think Katka, yeah, true. She asked about uh, the random um, rewarding. And I think you need to introduce this before. So you cannot just, or I, I see the risk at least that you are messing with the tests when you are rewarding and when not um, because they are not expecting it and then probably you should work with partial reinforcement before like training them that or telling yeah making sure they experience before you sometimes don't get something even though you expect it which is positive um, partial reinforcement so that not all positive trials are always rewarded so to prepare the end that they are not always rewarded. But this is, of course, an extra, um, an extra step again. This is from Christina. Another compliment. Thanks for the interesting and great talk. I've been thinking of the influence of test, the test arena situation, negative and positive emotions, when the animal arrives to the test arena. Would it be an option to not take the animal out of their home pen for testing? Yeah, that is the ideal scenario. That's what we are working on is perhaps too much. I also had slides on our trial to our, yeah, attempt to automate the task earlier in the, in the talk, and then we had to solve this out as well. 
this is of course the ideal scenario first the automation and then having the automated task in the home trends and that's what in we do in this pick web project this is the aim there but it's not that easy <laughs> um, because you first need to have this automation we had this um, we, we, we we started with the automation for the rodents um, it didn't work uh, it, it worked quite well but what for example is very um, difficult to automate is shaping because there there is the human component where you react, you react quickly you see the animal you see how it responds and even though we tried to come up with what are we actually doing breaking it out in rules that we can tell the automated system this was quite difficult but yeah the, the aim is definitely to to have it automated also to save time to have it over the lifetime of the animal and then also of course to have it in the home pen which would be amazing katarina has two questions more why do you think that you had the ceiling effect in one of your studies on pigs and could you please elaborate more on the training testing animals when the familiar con specifics were present in the neighboring pen for example, was it their home pen? Were those animals also focal animals? And if yes, were they also frustrated they weren't able to perform the task? So maybe we'll start with why do you think that there was a ceiling effect on the study pigs? Yes, um, this is a question I cannot really um, answer. Um, I have been discussing this just last week also with um, experts in the judgment bias area. And uh, it's difficult to say. I also we did brainstorming also with Ima and Luca before, and we tried in the second batch. We tried to. It's it's always a question. You you can of course have stronger punishers, so it's always a balance of um, reward and punisher. But we try not to have this problem with this because we have the trial initiator, so we don't really need a punisher. But of course, you can always make a go response harder. So for the Horses, for example, I had a little barrier, I had to make a detour, so to tell them, think about it, whether you really want to go, basically. Um, and for the pigs now, we came up with the drawer system, basically, so they had to open the, you didn't see this because this was still old pictures, but they had to slide open to actually access the food, so more work to do, basically. We had, we tried to make it harder when we realized the pigs are going too often. Um, it's, we still have to analyze the data, so I'm a bit careful to say something about that. didn't seem to have too well just from the gut feeling. Um, I don't really know otherwise. I mean, they are curious, they are explorative, they, uh, they are neophilic animals in contrast to others. So, yeah, they are going, but I, unfortunately, I wish I could give the answer because then we would try to change it. <laughs> I cannot. And the second was about the companions. Yeah, that, that's very good and very important. So um, we it's not the home pen. It's like a, a, a little, we call it body pen. It's a little pen on the side uh, where we always had two bodies. And um, they were animals that were not, um, so we, let me think that I don't say anything anymore. Yes, they are not trained or tested animals. Um, so they were just there to be buddies, <laughs> um, basically. And we also have this now for the new um, study that I quickly showed you um, about systematically testing the effect of the social window. Um, there we also have buddies that are just buddies and are not going to be trained or tested. However, in Christina, who is also here, as I saw now, um, first experiment, um, these buddies were also trained and tested. and um, they were you, you need to be a bit careful and christina please correct me if i'm wrong but um for example you, whether you feed them or not in there so that they don't get frustrated or that, that they don't start to scream and say give me more give me more if if they are otherwise they they were very relaxed in there so you need to be a bit careful with how to how to treat them basically there um but otherwise they were just lying down sometimes just looking basically but not getting frustrated or because then the effect of having a body would yeah you're absolutely right Katya would not be helpful <laughs> anymore 
Building on this buddy idea, Allison asks, what were the differences in how the animals performed in the test with or without the social window? Do you think this social window is important for tests that do not involve training, such as the novel object test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the result, I, I don't know, because we will only start in today, 10 days, so we cannot say anything. We can just tell from our experience um, that we felt it was a big difference and that they, they were just so much more relaxed and um, easygoing. Um, but as I said, we need to test it systematically because it was a cross experiment and of course we cannot really compare them the data. Um, yes, we have been also thinking about whether or not we involve also a, some common tests that we are usually not doing, but something that doesn't involve training like novel object tests and see whether the test results are different. I mean, the question is then, if the test results are different, what is the more valid data? It's, it's difficult to say. I mean, the animals might be distracted and it's perhaps less valid with, with companions, but if you just test for social isolation basically and not for fearfulness, for example, in general, then, it might be the other way around. It's difficult then, of course, to say, um, then you would need to have more control groups, basically. Um, but yeah, it's something definitely to think about and at least to explore. I, th I think what is important is to have be at least open to start thinking about social animals, perhaps not testing in social isolation, at least the thought. And then we need, of course, to do more research on whether how this is, yeah, um, yeah what it make, means for the data, but at least we should allow this thought, I think. Linda says, really interesting topic and a great talk. A colleague of mine is asking animals to double tap to show no response, which I think is really cool. Have you used this? And if so, can you elaborate on this method? It seems to indicate a high level of intellect. Okay, so double tap means probably bum bum. And that's like that. how I interpret it, yeah. Okay. Um, no, <laughs> we haven't used it. I'm, I'm just trying to think. Um, I mean, it is, it is I guess it is similar. It's just that ours didn't have to double, but just one. But they have to ind indicate that it was a that it is a negative trial. I guess you could also train them to do it. I, I don't see a reason why you couldn't do it to do it double. Probably they are not too happy about it because they want to continue then <laughs> uh, playing the game. Um, but I don't, I mean, it's a question of shaping. If you tell them to do it twice, I guess they will do it twice. It probably takes a bit longer, but I don't see why they, shouldn't shouldn't learn it at the moment i don't see uh, the real advantage but perhaps i just don't see it at the moment that's very not possible the final question i think for the sake of time and i don't see any more questions in the chat box chat box is again back to the social companions do you think the social relationship between the buddy animals could impact the results that is, if a subordinate animal is being tested and the dominant animal is the buddy, would the test animal be more likely to show a pessimistic response? Yeah, good question. We have no idea um, how this relationship would influence it. Yeah, how this, of whether dominance or subordinance would influence it. I, I, my gut feeling would be it's not about being then more pessimistic. It's probably more about, yeah, how you feel in the test situation. Yeah, and then perhaps also how you respond in the ambiguous cues. But usually they get into a run. It's not like in a test. I mean, as I said before, also in the, in the bigger project now, they were not tested with companions anymore. So this was because it was a boredom project and we really didn't want them to to have periods of interaction and talking to each other and so on while testing for boredom. Um, so we didn't test them with the companions anymore. And it's really important in the beginning, once as long as they don't really know what to do and they need to figure out the rules. 
later it will be like they go, get into a run, you know, like they go, they go to initiate, go, initiate, go. And you saw that the, the solar window was basically behind it. So it's, uh, it's not like it's in the way and they always see it. It's if they are in the run, they don't even necessarily see the other pig. So my gut feeling would be it's not so problematic, but definitely something to take, um, yeah, to think about and take care of, yeah. Also, if you have friends or not, or if there was a fight before or afterward, whatever, all things that could potentially affect it, yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a lot of questions. So thank you for your patience and for your wonderful answers and for taking the time to speak with us all tonight. Uh, fantastic presentation. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you also very much.